day, let me introduce you to something which I must admit we do not experience every day, but I assume it's very important to take care of. With this lecture, I want to raise awareness of some of specificity of treatment of Parkinsonian patients through two cases of acute pancreatitis in patients with Parkinson's disease. My name is Sanja Kovacic. I am an intensive neurologist at the Department of Neurology in General Hospital Zabok in Croatia and on faculty on dental medicine and health in OSIC. I would like to thank the organizers of NeuroForum Conference for the invitation to speak on this topic today. We must first shed light on why it is important to know how to properly treat Parkinson's disease in the context of acute pancreatitis. If we know how to ask a clinical question and we are aware that there is a problem indeed, we will surely be able to find a solution. Let me start. We know that many relevant studies have confirmed the following major comorbidities in Parkinson's diseases. For all that, Parkinson's disease patients who often require complicated dosing or titration schedules actually need administration of therapies from multiple drug classes. On the other side, acute pancreatitis represent a diffuse systemic immunoinflammatory response to localized process of autodigestion in pancreas. It can range in intensity from a mild disease to a severe disorder with prolonged hospitalization and frequent complications. In 80% of cases, pancreatitis is sampled by gallstones and alcohol, but it can also be caused by a high number of clinical reasons like medications and toxins and other reasons listed here. Among the listed causes of pancreatitis, drug-induced pancreatitis should also be appreciated. In fact, the increasing number of pharmacological agents is associated with increased incidence of acute pancreatitis. Over 100 drugs have been reported in the scientific literature to cause it. Most reviewers claim that drug-induced acute pancreatitis account up to 5% and is estimated the third most frequent cause of acute pancreatitis after gallstones and alcohol. And now I would like to present two distinct cases of acute pancreatitis in Parkinsonian patients. The first patient who had been treated with multiple medications suffered from drug-induced pancreatitis. He's a 76-year-old male Parkinsonian patient admitted to hospital due to a progression of extrapyramidal symptoms and due to the need for the titration of anti-Parkinson's therapy. His medical history included hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and ischemic stroke. It is important to say that he had no history of biliary or pancreatic disease, alcohol consumption, and his triglyceride values were within normal values. He had been regularly taking levodopa, carbidopa, and entacapon for eight years, seropinirol in a dose of eight milligram for more than one year, 100 milligram of aspirin for more than 10 years, perindopril in a dose of 10 milligram for two years, amlodipine in dose of 10 milligram for two years, glimepiridine in a daily dose of four milligram for more than five years, diclofenac for occasional back pain, but periodically and rare indeed, as well as simvastatin in a dose of 20 milligrams for more than five years. Plenty of therapy, really. How was the course of the disease and the titration of therapy in the hospital? On the second day of hospitalization, the patient received increased dose of rapinirol, 12 milligram instead of prior eight milligram dose, in order for a more effective control of extrapyramidal symptoms. On the fifth day of his stay on the ward, the patient received a daily dose regularly, 75 milligram of diclofenac intramuscularly in order to treat, to treat uh, low back pain. On the seventh day of hospitalization, the patient experienced 
epigastric pain, along with a significant increase of his serum amylase and lipase levels. From the biochemical findings of the patient's serum, we see that amylases and lipases are multiplied. Imaging scans that uh, were taken you know, show biliary tract dilatation or calculi, the pancreas and surrounding tissue were edematose, but without necrosis or fusions. The patient was diagnosed with drug uh, induced pancreatitis and class as grade one using Ransom's criteria. With adequate treatment, the patient's symptoms subsided and he had a favorable clinical course consistent with serous pancreatitis. He was discharged home with the same medication with the exception of diclofenac. In 10 years subsequent medical monitoring, he has never experienced signs of recurrent pancreatitis. I must also say we ruled out the most common causes of acute pancreatitis and the diagnosis of drug-induced pancreatitis was also based on the fact that the symptoms uh, in these particular patients were very mild. We have scientific evidence that drug-induced pancreatitis is usually mild. At the time we diagnosed drug-induced pancreatitis, it was necessary to find a medication that would be the cause. As mentioned earlier, the patient takes many medications for various comorbidities. First on the list are anti-Parkinsonic medications, levodopa and rapinero. So far, there is no evidence of an association between these drugs and a possible cause of drug-induced pancreatitis. Our patient had been receiving ACE inhibitor perindopril in a fixed dose combination with the antihypertensive drug amlodipine. The results of European uh, case control study uh, that include more than 700 patients with acute pancreatitis indicated that ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers were actually associated with an increased risk. The use of antidiabetic glimepirate was associated with a raised risk of acute drug-induced pancreatitis in several reports. Lastly, our patient had more than five-year history of using simvastatin in dose of 20 milligrams and reports of statin-induced acute pancreatitis indicate statin as possible positive agents. In our first patient, probably except for levodopa and dropenerol, almost all the drugs he was taking could have theoretically been the cause of pancreatitis. In addition to increased dose of ropinirol, uh, during his hospital stay, uh, our patient received a diclofenoc regularly, unlike the previous periodic sampling. Although pancreatitis is listed as a rare complication of chronic NSAID use, there are several evidences of possible etiological connection. In the work of Kahn and Edward from 1993 listed here, it has been suggested that the incidence of NSAID caused pancreatitis is probably underestimated because patients with less severe symptoms are not tested routinely for raised serum amylase. The authors argued that abdominal pain, vomiting, and nausea are often reported uh, by patients unique, uh, using NSAIDs, so that these symptoms are often regarded as manifestation of gastritis and not as pancreatitis. There's another association between Parkinson's disease and acute pancreatitis that I would like to highlight, and this is the challenge of treating Parkinson's disease in patients with acute pancreatitis. I would also like to explain this through one case report. Second patient was an 80-year-old female diagnosed with D who presented with severe abdominal pain and vomiting requiring hospital admission. Uh, her PD symptoms had been treated with levodopa, entercapone, ropinirol in an extended released formulation. 
she was able to walk and her cognitive functions show no significant problems. From the biochemical findings of the patient serum, we see that amylases and lipases are multiplied. If you can recall the findings of the first patient, the values here are much higher. The patient was classed as a grade two pancreatitis using Ransom's criteria. Biliary ultrasound show acute cholecystitis. The patient refused surgery and was treated conservatively and gradually improved. Years later, the patient presented to the emergency room again with clinical and biochemical signs of recurrent pancreatitis, Ransom's grade three. From the biochemical findings of the patient serum, we see that amylases and lipases are multiplied more than in first stage. Imaging studies of the abdomen show signs of cholecystopancreatitis with enlarged gold bladder, thicknet wall, and pancreatic and peripancreatic edema. The patient was admitted to the intensive care unit. She continued to take her usual peroral antiparkinsonic medication in such a way that the tablets were crushed and administered via a nasogastric tube. On the first day on hospitalization, she showed marked clinical deterioration and symptoms listed here with somnolency, febrile up to 40 degrees, uh, muscular rigidity, and so on. The medical history of anti Parkinsonian drug potential withdrawal due to poor absorption with the typical clinical findings and laboratory data indicated the development of neuroleptic malignant like syndrome. After providing adequate therapy, clinical improvement occurred. And at this charge from hospital, she was able to walk with the help of another person. And she expressed moderate cognitive deterioration on cognitive function test. If you recall, the patient had normal cognitive functions before. Physician treating patients with PD and pancreatitis face some problems. In some protocols, nasogastric decompression is essential. Oral intake is prohibited and antisecretory drugs are used in attempts to reduce gastrointestinal secretion. On the other side, we know that there is a spectrum of complica complications associated with the withdrawal of dopamine agonist and levodopa medications. A number of questions arise from this case. First question I ask myself in is whether our patient really received his anti-Parkinsonian therapy and in an adequate dose. The neurologist has been informed that it was. Okay. Second, if he was given the medicine, should tablets designed as prolonged release tab tablets be allowed to be crushed and administered via a nasogastric tube? Of course not, we all know that. But I will talk about that a little more detail later. However, we still need to take particular care of possible changes in the level of intestinal drug absorption, which have been proven to be very important in treating patients with PD. Normally, levodopa is rapidly absorbed from the proximal small intestine and is converted into dopamine in the brain. In a study published at uh, 2019 in the journal Nature Communications, Scientists from the University of Groningen show in animal model that the gut bacteria can metabolize levodopa into dopamine. Bacterial tyrosine decarboxylases efficiently convert levodopa to dopamine, even in the presence of tyrosine, a competitive substrate. And since dopamine cannot cross the blood brain barrier, this makes them medication, of course, less effective. Let me discuss now the crushing of the prolonged release of formulations of levodopa and dopamine agonist tablets. All manufacturer instructions state that extended release tablets should not be chewed 
crushed or divided, but should be swallowed whole. Nevertheless, today such formulations are very popular for the reason of better adherence and more stable concentration of the drug in the blood in order to avoid the development of motor fluctuations and dyskinesia. We must also keep in mind that patients with Parkinson's and elderly patients in general develop dysphagia. Polypharmacy, dysphagia, and age-related patholog pathological changes in older adults present challenges for medication management, of course. The limited availability of oral liquids, patches, suppositorios, means that crushing tablets and emptying powder from capsules is very common, particularly in aged care facilities and nursing homes. Multiple medications are often crushed together and mixed with a food or a water. Altering soling dosage forms is associated with a number of problems. The stability and bioavailability of drugs can be significantly changed by the simple act of crushing a tablet. Finally, to conclude, if patients receive medication via nasogastric tube, the therapy should be switched from prolonged release tablets to immediate release tablets according to the scheme described by the manufacturer. In circumstances where the bowel may cause problems with drug absorption, and thus lead to deterioration uh, in the motor sim symptoms of PD. A better option uh, uh, might be switching to an available alternative route of drug intake. In case of levodopa, it can be given intravenously if both oral or nasogastric feeding are contraindicated. Options for dopamine agonists include transdermal protigotin and apomorphine by injections or continuous infusion. Thank you very much for your attention.